I'd like to welcome all of you to this uh, evening's event. As you may already know, Politics and Prose hosts hundreds of in-person events along with our partnered events, supported events, trips, and classes, some of which are now being held at our new lo uh, newly relocated locations at the Wharf and Union Market. So please uh, visit our website for a full list. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. First of all, uh, please turn off or silence your cell phones so as not to disturb the uh, event. For the Q&A, please remember to step up to the microphone over here by the pillar before asking your questions so we can not only hear and enjoy the conversation but also ensure that it is recorded. For those of you who want to buy copies of the book, we are selling them by the registers at the front of the store. We will be doing a signing after the Q&A, so if you'd like to get your book signed, please also line up by the pillar uh, over here. And lastly, once the event is complete, we ask that you fold up your chairs, lean them against something sturdy to help us out a bit. I am honored to introduce David Diop to all of you. He is the head of the Arts, Languages, and Literature Department at the University of Pau. His first novel, At Night All Blood is Black, which was translated to English by Anna Moschovakis, has been awarded the Strega Europe, Europe Prize, the LA, the LA Times Book Prize, and the Man Booker International Prize. Tonight, he will be talking about his most recent novel, Beyond the Door of No Return, which, which was translated into English by Sam Taylor. Both a love story and historical epic, the New Yorker wrote in the review of the book that his latest is a mesmerizing tale of capture, getaway, and revenge. The Ops novel, which culminates in a terrifying sequence of events, is a testament to fiction's ability to uncover our self-deceptions, leaving them as if exposed to the African sun at its zenith. He will be in conversation tonight with Catherine Kleppinger and, Nicola, uh, and Nicholas Elliott. Catherine is Associate Professor of French and Francophone Studies and in International Affairs at George Washington University. Her research and teaching center on, the relate, center on the related fields of French cultural studies and contemporary French and Francophone literature. Nicholas will be interpreting uh, for David. Everyone, let us all welcome David Diop, Catherine Kleppinger, and Nicholas Elliott. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'm delighted to be here and to welcome our author, David Diop. Um, before I begin, I was actually just curious to see how many people have read anything by uh, Mr. Diop, just to kind of get a sense of, OK, great. This is amazing. Um, just to sense you know, who, what kind of audience we have here. Um, so as our you know, introduction just stated, this is a lovely book of kind of travel, of love and quest, you know, searching and also revenge. Um, so my first question for our guest tonight is to tell us a bit more about how you came to write the novel of this topic in particular. And one thing that bears mentioning is that it takes place in the 1700s, so also the importance of the 18th century as a setting. Alors, merci beaucoup pour votre aimable introduction. Uh, je suis enseignant en littérature du XVIIIe siècle à l'université en, en France et je travaille sur les récits de voyage. Et euh, il se trouve que j'ai rencontré un texte un peu par hasard qui s'intitulait « Voyage au Sénégal » et qui avait été écrit par Michel Adanson et publié en 1757 à Paris. Thank you for your introduction. I teach 18th century literature at a university in France, and my specialty, what I work on, is travel narratives. It happens that I encountered a text entitled Voyage au Sénégal, Voyage to Senegal, which is by Michel Adanson and was published in 1757. Et donc, j'ai écrit euh, toute une série d'articles sur ce Michel Adanson, qui est un botaniste du 18e siècle, qui a vraiment existé. Et euh, j'ai été très intéressé par ce livre parce que c'est un récit de voyage qui va au Sénégal et qui retrace et qui décrit un Sénégal que je connais, 
qui est lointain en même temps. C'est-à-dire que c'est un Sénégal d'il y a trois siècles où je reconnais des villes, des villages que moi-même j'ai vus. And I guess my... Oh, sorry, sorry. Oops. <laughs> so, I wrote a whole series of articles about Michel Adanson, who was a botanist in the 18th century, a person who really existed. And what really interested me about this book is that it's a travel narrative about Senegal, which is a Senegal that I know and yet that is distance distant, meaning it's a Senegal of three centuries ago, and yet I recognize in it cities, villages that I have seen. And so I think one thing that's really remarkable about the book is this character, you know, Michel Adanson. And could you tell us a little bit more about what makes him such a striking, both, you know, real historical figure, but then also as a subject of a fictionalized, you know, development? Oui, alors euh, Michel Adanson est un voyageur intéressant. Pourquoi Parce qu'il a appris le Wolof, qui est une langue qui est parlée au Sénégal. C'est une langue vernaculaire avec le français. Et euh, il a appris cette langue parce qu'il voulait connaître la propriété des plantes directement de la bouche des personnes savantes qu'il a pu repérer au Sénégal, savantes dans le domaine de la pharmacopée. Michel Adanson is an interesting traveler because he chose to learn Wolof, which is a language spoken in Senegal. It's a vernacular language there, along with French. And Michel Adanson ch chose to learn this language because he wanted to know the properties of plants directly from the lips of wise people, knowledgeable people there who knew about pharmacopoeia. Et alors, donc j'ai écrit des articles sur lui et euh, parce qu'il m'intéressait. Il a fait son voyage, il n'avait que 23 ans, donc c'était un tout jeune homme. Et euh, j'ai écrit des articles et il y a un doctorant sénégalais en, en histoire qui s'appelle Ousmane Seidi, qui est venu me voir et qui est venu à ma rencontre un jour dans mon université et qui m'a dit, « Monsieur Diop, ce que vous avez écrit sur Michel Adanson, c'est très intéressant, mais ce n'est pas tout à fait juste. » Alors, je lui ai donné deux minutes. J'ai dit, « Mais ce petit doctorant-là, il a quand même du toupet. On va voir. » Adanson, because he was interesting to me. This was a traveler who went to Senegal at the age of 23, so a very young man. And after I wrote these articles, a doctoral candidate in history in Senegal named Ousmane Saidi came to find me at my university. And he came up to me and he said to me, what you've written about Michel Adanson is very interesting, but not entirely accurate. So. I decided to give him two minutes. I said to myself, this little doctoral candidate here is quite ballsy. Let's see what he has to say. Et en fait, au bout d'une minute, il m'avait convaincu. Il avait raison. <laughs> euh, pourquoi Parce qu'il était allé au Muséum d'Histoire Naturelle de Paris et il avait trouvé tous les papiers de Michel Adanson, les brouillons de Michel Adanson. Et alors là, c'est ce moment-là qui a fait que je n'étais plus professeur à l'université, je suis redevenu écrivain. Parce que c'est une mine, c'est extraordinaire ce qu'il a trouvé dans ces papiers de Michel Adanson. In fact, after one minute, the doctoral candidate had convinced, convinced me. Why? because he went to the Museum of Natural History in Paris, and he found all of Michel Adanson's papers, his rough drafts, and so on. And in that moment, when I heard about this, that's when I transformed from the university professor back to the writer, because what I found out about here was an extraordinary gold mine of material. 
And actually speaking of that material, my next question is, you know, I think one thing that's really striking and particularly to learn that a lot of it is based on historical research and accuracy is is perceptions of slavery and perceptions of, you know, African people. Could you tell us a little bit more about what's so kind of shockingly modern about what he had to say? Alors, Michel Adanson, c'est un, un homme des Lumières, c'est un cartésien, et c'est un, un personnage qui, euh, en fait, comme beaucoup de gens, euh, ne voyait pas l'esclavage dans sa cruauté et dans sa réalité, parce qu'ils étaient loin de cela. Et donc, euh, il a rencontré l'esclavage, il a critiqué l'esclavage, mais pas pour des raisons euh, humanistes, mais pour des raisons économiques. Michel Adanson was a man of the Enlightenment. He was a Cartesian. He was a figure like many people who did not see the cruelty and reality of slavery because he was far from it. And when he did encounter slavery, he criticized it, but not for humanist reason, reasons. He criticized it for economic reasons. Et euh, c'est ainsi qu'il a expliqué que euh, il ne trouvait pas rentable qu'on envoie des Africains aux Amériques, alors que on pouvait euh, les faire travailler sur place en, en Afrique, à, à faire du sucre, hein, à travailler dans des champs pour ça. Et cette idée-là, c'est pour moi une idée euh, qui est intéressante parce qu'il y a une critique de l'esclavage, mais ce n'est pas une critique philanthropique. So, Adanson explained that it was not good business or it wasn't profitable to send Africans to the Americas when they could be put to work in Africa, making sugar, working in the fields. That particular idea is interesting to me because it is a critique of slavery, but it's not a philanthropic critique. Oui, je continue. <laughs> Et euh, donc, euh, la fiction m'a permis, en fait, de lui faire rencontrer la cruauté de l'esclavage. C'est-à-dire que j'ai créé un personnage féminin dont il va tomber amoureux. Et ce personnage féminin, en fait, va le ramener à la dure réalité de l'esclavage. Donc là, je quitte le Michel Adanson euh, de l'histoire, le, le Michel Adanson euh, véritable, et j'arrive à la fiction. Fiction allowed me to make Michel Adanson encounter the cruelty of slavery. I created a female character whom Michel Adanson is going to fall in love with, and knowing that character is what brings him back to the harsh reality of slavery. So in that moment, I leave the historical Michel Adanson, the real Michel Adanson, and that's where we come into fiction. And I think this actually is a great segue to a question I've been thinking about, but I will come back to some of the structure of the novel, is, um, you know, two parts. One is, you know, what can fiction do that historical narratives can't? You know, that this is definitely something different, but also something more. Um, and then the second question is, you know, you, you have two lives as a writer of fiction and as a research academic. And I was also curious how does, you know, how does your academic career make your fiction either more difficult or more enriching? You know, like how do those two uh, sides of the same coin dialogue with each other? Alors, je vais commencer par répondre à la seconde question parce que je sens que je vais oublier la première. <laughs> Alors, I'll start by answering the second question because I have a feeling that I'm going to forget the first. Donc, euh, ce qui euh, m'intéresse quand j'écris de la fiction, c'est euh, d'avoir une approche de l'écriture euh, vraiment différente. 
quand euh, je suis euh, enseignant, euh, quand je suis universitaire, j'écris des livres. Et j'écris des livres avec des notes de bas de page très importantes. C'est la preuve que je ne mens pas, que je dis la vérité ou que j'essaie de m'en rapprocher. What interests me when I write fiction is that it's a different approach to writing. As a professor, as an academic, I write books with very long footnotes. These are proof that I am not lying, that I'm telling the truth, or at least that I'm trying to get close to the truth. Donc ça, c'est euh, une écriture peut-être euh, contrainte. Euh, tandis que quand j'écris de la fiction, euh, il n'y a pas de note de bas de page. Et surtout, il y a un rapport à la documentation que j'essaie je, d'amasser sur le sujet qui m'intéresse qui euh, est différent parce que je ne prends pas de notes. C'est-à-dire que je fais euh, exactement l'inverse que, ce que, que ce que font les, les universitaires qui prennent des notes ou des professeurs, tout simplement. Là, je fais confiance à ma mémoire affective. You could call this academic writing a form of constrained writing, whereas when I write fiction, there are no footnotes, and especially my relationship to the documentation, the research material that I try to amass is different because I don't take any notes, which is the opposite of what academics or professors do. They always take notes. And in doing that, in not taking notes, I'm trusting emotional memory. What I find really interesting here is that you know, you're talking about two ways of telling a story. There's the academic way or there's the fiction way. And so the first question, but rephrased, was that you know, what does the fictional way of telling the story give us that the academic way cannot? Uh, la littérature émeut et l'histoire explique. Mm -hmm. List. <laughs> Literature moves, moves our feelings. History explains. Et donc, euh, ce qui m'intéresse dans la littérature, c'est aussi la possibilité, euh, peut-être, de formuler ou, ou de traduire la complexité de l'humanité. C'est-à-dire que quand euh, la discipline historique s'empare d'un sujet, elle envisage les choses par euh, grands ensembles, par grandes questions. Et euh, ce que donne la littérature, c'est la possibilité d'entrer dans l'histoire par euh, des individus qui, dans le fond, euh, ont une sensibilité euh, qui nous rapproche d'eux. Et donc, pour moi, je pense que c'est une bonne façon, en fait, de comprendre la complexité des situations historiques dans lesquelles je place mes personnages. What interests me about literature is that it offers the possibility perhaps to articulate or formulate or translate the complexity of humanity. In history, in the discipline of history, when a subject is dealt with, it, what is dealt with is large sets, big questions. Literature gives us the possibility to enter history through individuals who have a sensibility that bring us closer to them. So I think that literature is actually a good way to understand the complex historical situations in which I place my characters. And I could get my students with that one paragraph. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, and so that's something that strikes me about your work as a whole. So all three of your novels, actually, is that there's always a form of kind of cross-cultural dialogue, exchange, You know, either colonial subjects in previous novels coming to France or in this particular novel, a French person coming to Senegal. And I'm wondering about this aspect of your writing where there's always kind of an outsider 
discovering a new locale and what that brings to the kind of emotional and um, you know even just intellectual understanding of your your themes. Oui, alors c'est vrai que jusqu'à présent, ce qui m'intéresse, c'est de faire voyager mes personnages euh, d'une rive à l'autre. Euh, dans Frères d'âme, j'ai mis en scène un tirailleur sénégalais qui venait combattre en France. Et dans La Porte du Voyage sans Retour, c'est un botaniste que je fais venir au Sénégal. Et en fait, ces deux personnages, euh, en, ils me traduisent. Euh, dans le fond, ils me traduisent, moi, parce que j'ai une double sensibilité culturelle et je navigue, moi aussi, entre une rive et une autre. It's true that up to the present, what is interesting, what has interested me is to create characters who travel from one shore to another. In All Night, At Night All Blood is Black, I created a Senegalese tirailleur who comes to France to fight. In Beyond the Door of No Return, it's a French botanist who goes to Senegal. These two characters, in a sense, offer me the opportunity to translate the double cultural sensitivity or sensibility that is mine, because I, too, am sailing between these two shores. It also strikes me that your novels, and actually all three of them, including one about um, colonial subjects being put on display in the Universal, um, the World's Fair of 1889, um, that all of your stories are telling, they're relating an aspect of a historical event that we might not know about. You know, it's kind of the hidden underside of World War I, that there were colonial soldiers, or the hidden, you know, not talked about aspect of the World's Fair, that there were, you know, literally human zoos. And in this case, even that there is a French botanist capable of, you know, challenging slavery from however angle he does. So I guess what I'm asking, Law in a long fashion is is that also part of your approach of kind of understanding history in a new way from the dominant narratives that we might have already learned. Alors, euh, euh, pas nécessairement. <laughs> <laughs> euh, en fait, euh, ce qui se passe, c'est que en effet, euh, les romans que j'ai écrits jusqu'à présent se situent à un moment où la France avait un empire colonial et donc où euh, les relations étaient très dures. Hein. Mais euh, justement, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, ce qui m'intéresse, c'est euh, de voir comment euh, des personnages que je situe dans une époque euh, difficile eh bien, se débattent euh, avec euh, la difficulté ou affrontent cette difficulté euh, et euh, comment il se situe dans, dans une époque difficile. Et c'est vrai que, jusqu'à présent, j'ai situé l'action dans l'empire colonial français et ce n'était pas une période euh, de, où les contacts entre les peuples étaient euh, très doux. Not necessarily. Actually, what happens is that, indeed, the novels that I've written so far are set in the period when France had a colonial empire, and relations between the peoples then were harsh. What interests me, as I was saying earlier, is how characters that I've put in this harsh or difficult period, how these characters are going to struggle with that difficulty, how they deal with it, how they face it, and how that situates them. So it is true that so far in my novels, I've situated the action during the French colonial empire, which was certainly a period when relations between the people, Africans, French, were not gentle. 
And I mean, this is a bit of a turn, but I was also interested in the kind of literary technical side of the novel. Um, just as context, it's framed as a, a letter or a kind of dossier that is bequeathed, kind of hidden um, in his furniture, actually, to his daughter. And so when we read the novel, we're reading it kind of over the shoulder of his daughter after his death. And this concept of you know, a found manuscript is classic to historical French fiction. So you're kind of doubling not only the topic and the time period, but the style. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us about your decision to, to copy 18th century style in this. Oui, uh, ça m'intéressait. <laughs> De, de copier, d'imiter cette technique littéraire parce que je la trouve très intéressante comme vous l'avez dit euh, ça oblige, enfin ça nous mène, nous lecteurs à nous placer à côté du personnage auquel euh, on destine le texte et on lit par dessus son épaule ça c'est quelque chose qui m'intéresse euh, alors je vais laisser monsieur <rire> traduire Yes, I was interested in, in copying or imitating this literary technique. As you said, it forces us as readers to place ourselves next to the character for whom the te text is intended and to read over his or her shoulder. Alors, c'est une technique que j'ai utilisée parce que pour moi, euh, enfin, mon roman, c'est aussi l'histoire d'une transmission la transmission d'un manuscrit qui contient en fait l'essence de la vie d'un père à sa fille. I use this technique because in my eyes my novel is also the story of something being passed down, something being transmitted. What is being passed down is a manuscript that in fact holds the essence of a father's life being passed down to his daughter. Mais pour que la fille lise ce manuscrit caché, il fallait qu'elle puise dans sa mémoire ce qui l'a relié effectivement et affectivement à son père. But for the daughter to read this hidden ma manuscript, she had to go into her memory to find what connected her Effectively, effectively and affectively to her father. Et euh, ce manuscrit est caché dans un tiroir qu'elle découvre et qu'elle n'aurait pas pu, qu'elle aurait pu euh, ne pas découvrir. Pour moi, c'était important parce que ça signifie que, d'une manière générale, ceux qui euh, veulent apprendre quelque chose. Ceux qui euh, veulent finalement ouvrir des tiroirs de l'histoire, où il y a des manuscrits cachés, qui risquent de prendre la poussière, eh bien, ceux qui doivent le faire ou qui peuvent le faire, il faut qu'ils le veuillent, il faut qu'ils qu le désirent. Et donc, la fille de Michel Adanson, pour moi, devait vouloir ouvrir ce tiroir et le mériter. The manuscript is hidden in a drawer that the daughter finds, but she could have not found it. And that was important to me because it meant that, in general, people who want to learn, people who want to open drawers in history that could contain hidden manuscripts that run the risk of getting covered in dust, these people must want to do that. They must want to do it or desire to do it. And so Michel Adanson's daughter has to want to find the manuscript and she must deserve to find it. Et pour moi, c'était très important. Et j'ai eu euh, à rencontrer euh, des lecteurs comme vous en, en France, mais pas beaucoup, hein, je vous rassure, qui m'ont dit, mais on a acheté votre livre sur la foi qu'on y trouverait un récit 
sur l'Afrique. Et vous commencez à nous raconter une histoire d'un père avec sa fille qui se situe en France. That was very important. But I have to say, I have met readers like you, readers in France, and let me reassure you, there weren't many of them, but readers who said to me, we bought this book assuming that we would read a story about Africa, and yet you start about something between a daughter and her father in France. Et je leur ai répondu, l'Afrique se mérite. <laughs> And I answered them, Africa is something you must earn or deserve. And just as a follow-up, I did some research on Michel Adanson's daughter, um, also a real person, um, who did, in fact, benefit from transmission of plants and became a rather remarkable um, botanist herself, which is interesting. And I learned that she created the largest private arboretum in, still in existence today in France um, that is open to the public at certain times, but it's been in the same family for seven generations. Um, so I'm, I obviously know you know this, but I'm adding it because it's such an interesting connection to the story. It made me want to go visit. <laughs> it's outside Paris, a little bit south. Um, so anyone, anyone who wants to go, <laughs> join me. Um, yes, but anyway, as a... Um, Je ne suis pas allée, moi non plus. I was going to ask if you've been. I haven't been. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I, I'll, I'll end with one final question, just because I want to leave time for the audience. Um, how do you approach translation? I mean, obviously, you're working with someone. Um, were there surprises in the translation process or, um, you know, in both positive and challenging? Um, and how involved are you? Alors, euh, j'ai la chance d'avoir de, de, eu beaucoup de contacts avec des traductrices et des traducteurs, et notamment euh, avec Anna Moskovakis, qui est ma traductrice euh, de uh, Night Night All Blood is Black. Mm -hmm. Et uh, c'est passionnant parce que Nana Moskovakis est une écrivaine américaine et une poétesse. Et um, une fois, donc, on, on, au moment d'une rencontre, uh, j'ai uh, eu la chance d'entendre un texte qu'elle avait traduit, lu en anglais, évidemment. Et ce qui m'a beaucoup impressionné, c'est que j'ai retrouvé le rythme que je voulais imprimer au français, je l'ai retrouvé exactement en anglais. Donc, elle est vraiment très, très forte. Mais on a... Euh, pardon. On va laisser... Une rencontre, une rencontre ah. physique, c'est ça Oui, euh, c'est-à-dire que le texte a été lu. Oui. Oui. Um, I've had the good luck to have a lot of contacts with various translators, notably... Anna Moskovakis, who is really fascinating to work with because she's also an American writer and poet. And once when we had a public event together, I had the opportunity to hear a text that she translated of mine, read in English, of course. And what really impressed me is that in that her English, I found the exact rhythm that I had intended to set in the French. So she really is very, very good. Et euh, ce qui est aussi intéressant chez les traducteurs, c'est qu'ils euh, m'interrogent sur, par exemple, des données culturelles qui sont pour eux extrêmement étranges. Et euh, donc, euh, je les informe. Euh, et en même temps, je vois comment ils se débrouillent pour euh, traduire quelque chose qui n'existe pas dans leur propre société, mais... Euh, qu'ils essayent de traduire pour que les gens comprennent. Et je vais donner un exemple après. What's also interesting about working with translators is they ask me about things that they find strange. So I answer them, I inform them, but at the same time, I see how they deal with translating something that doesn't exist in their society so that people can understand what it is. And I'm now going to give an example. 
en Afrique de l'Ouest, il y a une, une caractéristique euh, culturelle qu'on appelle la parenté à plaisanterie. C'est-à-dire qu'on peut, entre deux familles, avec des noms bien précis, euh, se moquer les uns des autres sans que ça prête à conséquence, sans qu'il y ait une violence qui en découle. Eh bien, euh, il a fallu qu'Alain Moscovakis comprenne ce qu'était la parenté à plaisanterie et euh, essaie de le traduire. Et ça a été pour elle aussi une découverte. Donc, c'était intéressant. In West Africa, there is a cultural characteristic which is known as la parenté à plaisanterie, which I would translate as kidding kinship, in which two families can make fun of each other, can kid each other, without there being any consequences, without any violence coming from it. And so Anna Moskovakis had to understand this concept in order to translate it, and it was also a discovery for her, which was really interesting for me. That is such a wonderful way, actually, to transition to the audience in terms of questions you might have. I wanted to be sure to respect our time. Um, so that we can, we can launch your questions too. And I believe uh, there is a microphone right here um, for your um, questions. J'ai une technique euh, avec mes étudiants pour euh, entendre au moins une première question. Ah. Yeah. I, I have a technique with my students to get at least an initial question. Qui a une question mais n'ose pas la poser. Yeah. Who has a question but doesn't dare to ask it? J'ose poser une question. <laughs> well done. J'étais un peu en retard, mais I would like to know why a botanist? What's the significance of a botanist in this tale? Thank you. Alors, euh, Michel Adanson est un botaniste. Euh, je je ne peux pas lui enlever cela. C'est la raison pour laquelle il va au Sénégal pour découvrir des plantes et une faune différente et pour être en fait le premier à les décrire chez les savants français ou les savants européens. Donc ça, c'est une donnée historique. C'est-à-dire que euh, je, je, je choisis de faire de ce personnage le héros de mon roman mais je ne peux pas faire euh, abstraction de son, la véritable raison pour laquelle le véritable Michel Adanson est venu au Sénégal. C'est pour la botanique. Michel Adanson is a botanist. I can't take that away from him. It's the reason he went to Senegal. He went to Senegal to discover different plants, different fauna, and to be the first to describe them to French and European scholars. That is a historical fact. I chose to make him the hero of my novel, but I can't deny the reason for which Michel Adanson went to Senegal. He went to Senegal for botany. It, it does seem like there is a metaphor at the same time. I mean, I know I thought about asking the question, but um, didn't have time. Um, one of my favorite sentences in the novel was when he says, you know, I went to Senegal to learn to discover plants, and I discovered mankind, or men, depending on how it's translated. Um, so I did love that kind of interplay between different types of life and different forms of being. Um, I don't I mean it might have been based on historical, you know, accuracy, but I think, you know, it's a great question that also made me reflect a lot. Merci. <laughs> oui, bonsoir. Le technique uh, ça, ça ça fonctionné. And because the question that I want to ask, if you don't mind, is not about this book, but your book Frère d'Arme. And uh, the book is the product or was was used in our book club and one of my big questions was what is the the story, the folklore, the the le conte que, yeah. that you had there. What does it mean, and what does it do? And I didn't understand a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Alors, c'est un conte. Euh, je vais le résumer. Hein, c'est l'histoire donc euh, d'une jeune fille qui voit apparaître, euh, surgit de la brousse, un prince magnifique et avec une cour magnifique. 
Et ce prince, en fait, eh bien, vient la demander en mariage. Et elle tombe tout de suite amoureuse de ce prince. Il se trouve qu'il y a une personne dans l'entourage de cette princesse qui lui dit, attention, cet homme n'est pas un homme. Il n'a pas de cicatrice. Il n'a aucune cicatrice sur lui. Donc, attention. Elle, elle veut l'épouser. Donc, elle le suit. Et petit à petit, dans l'endroit où il l'amène, en fait, la, les, la, la cour, l'entourage, commence à se transformer à nouveau en bête de la brousse. Après, je vais continuer. So, it's a tale, and I'm going to summarize the tale before I explain. It's a story about a, a young woman who suddenly sees a magnificent prince appear from out of the brush um, with a magnificent court with him, and this prince asks her to marry him, and she immediately falls in love with him. One person in the entourage of this princess tells her, be careful of this man. He is not a man because he has no scars on him. But she wants to marry him, and she does, and she follows him into the brush. And little by little, when she's where he takes her, everyone in his court, everyone that surrounds him, turns into a wild animal. Et en fait, cet homme, ce, cet homme qui, qui s'est transformé, c'est un, un sorcier lion. Et il se trouve euh, que au Sénégal, le nom, le totem des Ndiaye, c'est le lion. Vous voyez Donc, cette histoire, c'est mon oncle qui me l'a racontée quand j'étais tout petit. Et c'est une histoire que tout le monde connaît au Sénégal. Puisque ensuite, et même d'ailleurs au-delà même du Sénégal, j'ai appris que dans d'autres pays, cette histoire revenait parce que la jeune femme finit par s'enfuir et elle a, grâce à la nourrice, trois objets qu'elle jette par-dessus son épaule et le lion essaie de la rattraper. Et c'est une montagne, une forêt, un fleuve, et chaque fois, euh, elle arrive à s'échapper. Actually, this man who turned into something else, this man who went into through a transformation, is a lion sorcerer or a sorcerer lion. And as it happens in Senegal the totem of the NDIs is the lion. This is a story that my uncle told me when I was just a little boy. Everyone in Senegal knows this story, and I've learned that, in fact, in other countries beyond Senegal, the story is also known. In the story, the young woman runs away, and thanks to her... Where's you? Nourrice? Um, I'm having a... Like a wet nurse. Oh, thanks to her wet nurse, she has three objects that she throws over her shoulder as the lion is trying to catch her. It's a mountain, a forest, and a river, and she manages to escape the lion. Et j'ai choisi d'intégrer cette histoire dans mon roman parce que mon personnage principal s'appelle Alpha Nyai. Et Alpha Nyai est réputé être un sorcier, un mangeur d'âme. Les gens pensent que c'est un sorcier autour de lui. Ah oui, c'est vrai. Donc, l'histoire que ça a commencé, oui, ok. Il voilà. fallait que je sache justement oui. euh, le sens du conte. En fait, ça, ça, je me suis dit, moi, je ne connais pas ce euh, conte et je ne sais euh. pas ce que ça veut dire. Et donc, je ne comprends rien. Ça, ça y est, vous avez compris <rire> Oui, oui, oui. Ah bon, compris. alors ça va. Personnage, <rire> c'est Alpha Ndiaye Alpha. Alpha, d'accord. Ndiaye, oui. Ndiaye, ok. Um, I chose to include this story in the novel because my protagonist, Alpha Niai, is thought to be a sorcerer and an eater of souls. The people around him think that he is a sorcerer. Mm -hmm. 
Oui, donc ça, ça revient en fait, ça, c'est comme les, oui, ça, c'est le début et la fin et très bien. J'ai compris maintenant. Je vous remercie. <rire> After that question, this one may not make a lot of sense because I was viewing the book as, I haven't read it yet, but as a Histoire de la, guerre, de la Grande Guerre. Um, and what I was thinking about, apropos of some of the earlier, the question about botany, is it seems like each of the subjects you've chosen for your novels have been very characteristically about the kind of interactions that were forced upon um, people from Senegal in the period that it takes place. So the, the people going and looking for plants and trying to understand the flora and the fauna makes total sense in the 18th century sense and so on and so forth for the late 19th and early 20th century. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how by choosing to focus fiction on three different characteristic issues in these three different periods. You've been able to explore different aspects of these cultural exchanges, these uh, histories, these interactions. Does that make sense? <laughs> oui, oui. Uh, bah, je, je crois que je l'ai dit pendant l'entretien. Uh, J'ai une double sensibilité culturelle. Uh, et donc... Uh, ce qui m'intéresse finalement dans ma pratique même de l'écriture, c'est de mettre, euh, euh, de, de, enfin, de réunir mm -hmm. des mondes mm -hmm. qui m'appartiennent à moi. Et euh, la littérature, moi, me permet finalement de concilier mes deux sensibilités culturelles. Pas simplement, pas les réconcilier mais les concilier. Il n'y a pas d'antagonisme. Et donc, euh, même si les histoires que j'inscris euh, et que, qui m'intéressent s'inscrivent dans une histoire violente et difficile, eh bien, euh, dans le fond, euh, pour moi, c'est un moyen, finalement, de faire se rencontrer deux mondes. Mais deux, deux mondes aux époques différentes. Et alors, c'est dire d'abord, pardon. Uh, pardon. Excusez-moi. As I think I said in the conversation, I have a double cultural sensibility. And what interests me in my practice of writing is to put the worlds that belong to me together. Liter literature allows me to concile my two cultural sensibilities, not reconcile. There's no antagonism, but to put them together. And so even if I set my stories in violent, difficult history, ultimately, they are a way for two worlds to meet. And what I wanted to follow up with on that is it's three very different, yet each characteristic periods with different types of violence and different types of encounters. And I wondered how playing around with that idea as you wrote these three different novels enabled you to see or explore these interactions in different ways. C'est que ce sont trois périodes distinctes et alors trois histoires de violence différentes. Et comment est-ce que ça a marché pour vous qui êtes historien du, des Lumières, mais aussi ce sont des histoires qui se, se, se déroulent dans, au, à la fin du 19e et puis au début, dans la Grande Guerre euh. J'ai eu l'idée d'écrire, par exemple, Frère d'âme, il y a très longtemps, en fait. C'est-à-dire que mon éditeur n'est peut-être pas très content quand je lui dis que, pour moi, avant qu'un livre soit écrit, il faut une quinzaine d'années. <rire> Mais euh, j'ai les idées en amont. Et donc, euh, dans le fond, sans le faire volontairement, je me, je me documente sur ces différentes périodes historiques. Je lis des textes qui me surprennent et qui attirent mon attention et qui, après, euh, vont relever de ma mémoire affective, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure. Et c'est cette 
mémoire affective qui entre en jeu au moment où j'écris. Donc, euh, en fait, j'essaie de créer des atmosphères en, euh, finalement, allant trouver des informations. Et ces informations, à un moment donné, euh, ben, elles se s'agence et euh, là je sens que c'est le moment de d'écrire même si c'est pas une période dont je suis un spécialiste merci I had the idea to write at night all blood is black a very long time ago Perhaps my publisher isn't happy when I say this to him, but before I sit down to write a book, generally I need about 15 years. So the ideas exist ahead of time. And during that period, without necessarily being intentional about it, I'm researching historical periods. I'm reading texts that interest me, that surprise me, and that create an emotional memory that I'm going to use to write the book. I try to create atmospheres by going to get information. And this information, at a certain point, all fits together. And that's when I feel I'm ready to write, even if I'm not a specialist in the period that I'm writing about. Does that mean we're, uh, you're working on a new one? <laughs> that, oh. Oui. Ah, that's exciting. <laughs> Alors là, vous pouvez me torturer, je ne dirai rien. You can torture me, I won't say a word. Well, I'll just say that I'm very excited. <laughs> c'est pas parce que je ne vous trouve pas sympathique, hein, mais euh, c'est parce que si j'en dis un mot, eh bien l'atmosphère que je suis en train de construire, il eh, y a comme une effraction. Et, et, et ça oriente après l'écriture dans un sens que, qui n'est peut-être pas celui que je voulais choisir et que je choisirais au bout. C'est vraiment un entretien avec moi-même. Euh, voilà. Mais je vous tiendrai au courant dès que vous... Any more questions? Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, it, it, I'm, it's not that I don't find you to be a nice group of people that I don't like you, it's that if I say a word about the book I'm writing, the atmosphere I'm trying to create, it's as if there was a break-in in this atmosphere, and that will orient the writing in a way that I perhaps would not have chosen, or, or that is not the direction I want to go in. It, it's really like a conversation with myself, but I will keep you posted. If there's no more questions, I'll just ask one other one that might be of interest as well, is that one of my areas of research is how authors are presented as authors in the media, um, particularly in France, but also here. And I'm wondering if you could tell us, you know, how do French journalists, literary journalists, speak about your work? Um, you know, are they, do you find the reception of your work limiting or, you know, well, understood, you know, there's such a debate in France about what the difference is between a French and a francophone writer and what that means. You know, how how has French, the French establishment, I guess I would say, responded to your work? Um. <laughs> Ça dépend des journalistes. Uh, C'est vraiment très variable. Et euh, il y a vraiment de tout. C'est-à-dire que des gens qui, dans le fond, mais ça c'est propre, je pense, à tous les journalistes, qui euh, s'appuient sur euh, des pitchs, c'est-à-dire une lecture euh, très superficielle et très rapide, et puis d'autres qui vont au fond des choses et qui, euh, euh, finalement, avec lesquels on a une discussion euh, intéressante, comme aujourd'hui avec vous. It really depends on the journalist. It's, it's extremely varied, and, and one gets everything. You have people, but I think this is true with 
all journalists who are basing themselves on pitches, a uh, quick and superficial reading. And then you have others who really go deep and with whom you can have an interesting conversation like the one I've had with you today. today. So it is really a, a very interesting conversation. And I'm wondering about the reception of your novels in Senegal. And if you have ever considered what Usman Semben did, he wrote, he was a wonderful novelist, and then all of his novels became films. And when I'm hearing this story, I'm a filmmaker, so I want to make a film uh -huh. uh, about your, your novel. Have you considered that? Oh. And I know Nicolai is a filmmaker, too. Oh. I was winning as well. <laughs> Alors, au, au Sénégal, la réception a été vraiment Super. positive. Très bien. Euh, J'ai rencontré aussi des journalistes euh, qui m'ont euh, posé des questions sur le texte. Mm -hmm. Et euh, ça a été vraiment un accueil euh, chaleureux. Mm -hmm. Et pour répondre à votre deuxième question, euh, je n'ai... Euh, oui, ça serait pour moi magnifique euh, qu'un film soit, soit fait euh, de la porte du voyage sans retour. Oui. C'est un film en costume. Je sais, c'est très dur. Une période, c'est beaucoup de travail et de budget. <rire> et un budget énorme. Énorme. <rire> Mais euh, c'est vrai que j'ai des amis qui m'ont dit que c'est un livre qui pourrait se prêter, oui. je pense, à Absolument. un film. Donc, euh, si vous voulez, je vous donnerai le nom de mon agent littéraire. Et... Vous discuterez. Ça marche. Merci. In Senegal, the reception was very positive. I met journalists who asked me questions about the text. It was a very warm welcome. As for your second question, yes, it, it would be magnificent to have a film made of the... Uh, yeah, I know I have a bad memory. Beyond the Door of No Return. But... It's a period film, and that means an enormous budget. But I do have friends who've said that the book could make a very good film. So if you want, I'll give you my literary agent's information, and you can talk. Maybe we'll all see each other next time for a film showing. A reunion. If there are no more questions, last call. And I think I'm happy to thank our invited guest tonight, author David Diop. Uh, merci encore. Uh, merci à vous. And thanks to the audience.